namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Suchetoye Olahodi Samya Sambutoshe. Namo Sadanto Suchetoye Olahodi Samya Sambutoshe. Wushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa 我今见闻得受持人皆如来真实意 Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. 师父上人各位师兄大家 阿弥陀佛, Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, February the 26th, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland. It is Friday, uh, let's see, no it's not, it's Saturday in California, the 24th. We are happily into Pisces, and a happy birthday to Dharma Master Hung Chur, uh, our senior nun, and the senior Western Buddhist monastic on the women's side, and uh, many more years to her. Uh, we're about to launch into uh, our investigation of the conversation between the Bodhisattva Manjushri and the future, the about to become pilgrim whose name is Sudhana, good wealth. Um, seems like this has been a, a, a prelude, a long build up, a slow, long build up to the actual uh, encounter between these two individuals, and we've come to that moment where what we've been waiting for, which is the uh, the the entire chapter 39, the Ganda Vyuha, the entering the Dharma realm, the Rufa Jeping, is built around the, the long journey of this one young man, and all of the uh, preparation for this has been in the Chinese measure. It's been two scrolls worth of text, two jian they call it, and how the Chinese measured chapters, sort of just divisions of the text. And all that is preparation, from the Buddha showing up, sending off light, to the, the bodhisattvas of ten directions arriving, their praises, their offerings, the Buddha's response. Uh, then Manjushri Bodhisattva arrives, and, and the Buddha uh, gives him permission to, to go down into the, the world of humans. And he does so, and then Shariputra shows up, oh my goodness. Uh, Shariputra has 6,000 uh, young beginning monks with him. And they're all deeply impressed by Manjushri Bodhisattva. And they just, uh, they want to become his students and they do. Manjushri accepts them and then teaches them. And then the dragons come, oh man, how unexpected to have all these dragons arrive, get taught by Manjushri and uh, they move on in their evolution. They leave their dragon bodies behind and go off to become devas or humans. And uh, then the scene focuses on a grove of trees in a city called Blessings City, Fuchang, to the east in a grove where there's a stupa, this religious structure. Uh, and there, um, the word goes out that Manjushri Bodhisattva is here. He's arrived. He's, he is available to teach. And from the city of blessings come these streams of people. And uh, the, they, it names them. There's leaders of the upasakas, the lay people, lay men. Leaders of the upasikas, the lay women. And it's interesting. I want to point out, we didn't make this point, that in the Avatamsaka, it does not distinguish Everything that happens to men happens equally to women. Then young men come out. Then the young women come out in the hundreds, and they gather around Manjushri. They're thrilled. They've got their picnic baskets. They've got their, their babies. They've got their grandparents. They're all there. And the uh, uh, Manjushri, at this point, starts to point out, this guy, he's the one. We do a quick check 
for the backstory of Sudhana Shamsai. We find out why he got that strange name, what his, his story is. And Manjushri begins to praise him, and Sudhana steps into the spotlight today for the very first time. That's where we are. So let's continue with our protocols in uh, getting us underway. Here we go. Ooh, it doesn't like that. Namo da it out, we should get a musical setting for homage to the Buddha's flower garland sutra of great expanded teaching at some point. We don't have that yet, but we might. Coming up. Okay. Further, to acknowledge country, we respectfully acknowledge the Kumbhomeri people, the Gambi language region, as traditional storytellers and custodians of the land where our monastery is located. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and to all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. All right, and Pomo people and the Ohlone people and the bell song. Bell sound wide resounds. Throughout a hundred million worlds, the Buddha's law is heard and spread all throughout the triple world. The wondrous sounds that everywhere fill the Dharma realm with peace. May those who hear it gain the strength to follow in faith the Buddha's path. Zhong Sheng Chuan San Qian Jie Nei Fo Fa Yang Wan Yi Guo Zhong Gong Xun Qi Fa Jie He Ping Li Yi Bao Tan Nuo Hu De. Indeed. Um, two days ago, here in the Gold Coast, we had uh, our third uh, Islamic mosque dedicated. This one is in Warongiri, which is uh, close by here. And uh, the, uh, in the last uh, eight or nine years, there's been a real uh, opening for our Muslim friends in the political spheres and in uh, interface spheres and social spheres. So um, we were really happy to attend because these are now friends. These are people who 
whom, with whom we have walked miles together, uh, and friends who've been to the monastery here, and now we're in the third mosque. And the, um, uh, in order, there were a lot of civic leaders there. The mayor was there, and our councilmen were there. And, and uh, the, to do the acknowledgement of country, they had uh, Auntie Jocelyn, and she was a young woman uh, who is, Auntie, Auntie is uh, just a term of respect. And she, I was really impressed with the way she uh, traced her own bloodline back to the Combo Mary people. And it was, uh, it was quite impressive that how the, uh, this has become part of civil society, that the, everybody else who came later, and that's, you gotta say, everybody, no matter whether you're a white person, uh, European, or uh, in this case, you know, Muslim friends from Yemen and from Pakistan and all, uh, and Chinese friends from, from Taiwan or China, uh, were all later comers, were all guests in Australia for the hosts who are the Kumbumeri people of the Ugambe language region. So to have her uh, speak from the source and say, you are all welcome here, and uh, it really, because uh, the, you know, the Aboriginal people trace their unbroken lineage back longer than any other humans on the planet. Um, it was, it, it felt, it, it was good to be welcomed and to be part of it. So just to be able to witness that. And the, the other interesting thing was that the, this mosque in Warungari um, has been in process for 12 years. They, they've had the, had the plans and had the, uh, the intention. It just finally was able to come to fruition to be there. So these, the, the, the people, the, the Muslim friends who were the hosts there uh, knew everybody because they've been working so long to get it together. And it was great to, to see the, the fruition of their efforts and how welcomed they felt, not just by the Aboriginal uh, traditional owners and custodians of the land, but also by everybody else. So we were able to be part of that. It was joyful. So here we go. Um, I gave the, preamb the preamble for today, the context in, in our sutra. This, by the way, what you're looking at uh, is a piece of the wall at Borobudur in Indonesia, where it's a stupa, a giant, giant stupa built by the kings of, of Indonesia at the time. And it's uh, this particular piece on the walls at Borobudur, the story of the Avatamsaka Sutra is told in stone. These are friezes, they're carved into blocks and then put into the wall. And all of Sudhana's 52 or 53 visits are immor immortalized there uh, on the wall in stone. So here is the beginning of the pilgrimage. Sudhana is this individual here on his knees about He's getting his first instructions right here. Yeah, this is it. Oh, did it jump? What happened here? Please come back. Okay, we got it there. Hey, hello. All right. Technical difficulties here, challenges. We'll work on it. All right. So, there we are. Um, Sudhana is receiving instructions from Manjushri and uh, behind him kneeling down here these are probably some of the 500 followers uh, whom he leads of, of whom he is the leader so yeah fascinating stuff once you once we start to poke around in these stories we get um, resonances left and right by golly so here we are. We're going to close that for now. Going to, that's a different story. We're going to close that for, there we are. All right. 
Got it. Actually, I'm muted. How could I be muted? Funny. Oh, okay. In that case, we're going to go back. One more time. Ar shi wan shu shi di pu sa, ru shi guan cha, shan sai tong zi yi, an wei kai yu, ar wei yan shuo yi che fo fa. So wei, shuo yi che fo ji ji fa, shuo yi che fo xiang xu fa, 说一切佛四地法，说一切佛众会清净法，说一切佛法轮化道法，说一切佛四相四身相好法，说一切佛法生成就法，说一切佛言辞辩才法，说一切。佛光明照耀法，说一切佛平等无二法。Okay, here we go. Then, Bodhisattva Manjushri, having contemplated the youth Sudana thus, gently instructed him, using analogies, and spoke the Buddha Dharma for him. That is to say. He spoke the Dharma that Buddhas gather together. He spoke the Dharma that Buddhas continue. He spoke the Dharma of Buddha's succession. He spoke the Dharma of the purity of Buddha's assemblies. He spoke the Dharma of Buddha's Dharma wheels that transform and guide beings. He spoke the Dharma of the hallmarks and characteristics of Buddha's physical bodies. He spoke the Dharma of how Buddhas bring their Dharma bodies into being. He spoke the Dharma of Buddha's eloquence in phrasing and expression. He spoke the Dharma of Buddha's illuminating light. He spoke the Dharma of Buddha's impartial non-duality. Okay, here we go. Now, I just I wanted to uh, mention um, Jerry just told me that my my mic was turned off. An instance earlier, my mic was turned on, but Somehow the software turned it off for me. If Jerry had not mentioned that, who knows how long I would have gone on with my, with absolutely nobody hearing what I was saying、uh, in on the internet. When we, when I lecture tomorrow with the, the lecture、uh, for the city of ten thousand Buddhas, I am all alone, with the sysop being somewhere far away. May not be there to tell me your microphone's off, dude. Ah,、oh. and why why bring it up when we just you know a disaster averted? It's because、uh, earlier before our lecture began today, we were trying to optimize the microphone so that not only if people here、uh, physically present in the Buddha Hall at Gold Coast can hear, but also. People on YouTube can hear. People on the、uh, Zoom channel that goes to China, the Vietnamese can, can all hear. Right. Furthermore, we want to be able to play a musical instrument and balance it with my voice and not have too much room noise, but just you know. So it reminded me of how this lecture series has evolved.、Um, as you all can't see, I could turn the computer around and you could. But that wouldn't work. You you could see then, what it, it's very much as if I'm sitting in the Starship Enterprise, with、uh, Captain James T. Kirk and Scotty and all and, and Lieutenant Uhura, all working to make this happen. Because there's I can see 
three computers uh, at once, and including mine, I have a, a muted room light illuminating just right. And, you know, so the point is, many, many hands, many, many hearts go into putting this lecture out uh, to make it work. And, and yet, um, we have one camera, one speaker, steady focus. And the goal is to bring the Buddha's wisdom to life, to, to invigorate, to make the sutra come alive. And many plates are spinning. Remember the magician who runs from pole to pole, keeping the plates from falling off, right? So all of those plates are spinning. So occasionally, somebody has to shout, your microphone's turned off. Oh, okay. All of that work is for nothing because the mic's turned off. Ah, so that's how it goes. Some days it's like that. Bodhisattva Manjushri saw Sudhana come out of the group and said, here's the one. This is our hero. He's the guy who's going to take all this instruction across the finish line to Buddhahood. And notice what he did. He gently instructed them using analogies. That's what he did. So we get a flavor of how, how Dharma is taught. Um, what did he do? He spoke the Buddha Dharma for him. The verb is to speak the Dharma. That's what we say. And what is this? What's the Dharma? And you speak it. Uh, it's funny language going on here, isn't it? What do we say? Uh, we say in Christianity, he preached the gospel. He preached the gospel. Uh, same kind of idea. The Buddha Dharma is a body of knowledge that exists beyond people. It's available in our own minds when we can calm them, purify them, get rid of the things that cover our minds, and tame our emotions down to a place where they're not upsetting us, uh, get rid of prejudices, get rid of uh, things that, that make us lean in one direction or the other. And there it is. There's the Buddha Dharma. They're inside waiting for us. It's kind of like going spelunking. People know what spelunking is. You dive in a cave. There are caves that are very, very deep. And I, I don't think I would ever volunteer to spelunk, but people do. They get all the ropes, they get the helmets, they get the right footgear, and they go down way, way deep. And miners do the same thing, I suppose. Miners are there for profit. Spelunkers are there for the thrill of it. And they go down, and sometimes when they get way down, they discover there is writing inside the cave, way down. But they have to brave courageously the dangers of going, your life is suspended on these ropes. And sometimes the deeper they go, the more literature written on the walls they discover. Well, our minds are just like that. And meditation, we hear about meditation, we hear the word samadhi. Samadhi is this natural, organic way to calm and transform the six senses so that when we go down into the mind, the writing on the walls of the mind emerges. The Dharma is there, and I'm, I'm pointing in a direction. I'm not for sure it's, you know, we say deep in the mind, it's not down. It could be circular, that when we expand the mind, we find that the Dharma is there. And sure, Master Hua would say, everything, everything, everything is speaking the wonderful Dharma. So he would say, everything is there. It's just that we're, we're deaf to it. It's not that it's not speaking all the time. It's that we are 
holding ourselves so tight or we're so deeply covered or we're attached to one sound and not hearing everything. As a result, we don't hear the Dharma. So that's the Dharma. And the Buddha, our Prince Shakyamuni, the Prince Siddhartha became Shakyamuni Buddha, went out and prepared himself for six years so he could hear it. And once he woke up, he was able to kind of bring it up from down below or bring it in from surrounding wherever it was. And the Dharma was available for him to speak entire sutras. So here he is, he's speaking the Avatamsaka, this particular piece of it, and look at all the preparation that had to be in place. It all began with him saying, the Gandavyuha Dharma is coming. I'm going to finish the Avatamsaka Sutra. You want to hear it? Wow, bodhisattvas from 10 directions fly in. World leaders, spirits of all descriptions come in. And now, 500 gatherings of Upasaka, Upasika, uh, Tongzi and Tongnu, all have Kumara and Kumari, that's it, have all shown up to hear it too. Yes, we want to hear it. So that's it. Manjushri has now, from all that was available to him, has focused down on exactly what Sudhana can hear. What is it? He gently instructed him using analogies. What does it mean to teach him with analogies? He's, uh, what would be no analogy? Teaching with no analogies, it would be something like, everything falls apart, do you know that? Everything that comes together based on conditions is gonna fall apart, so get ready, because it's gonna hurt when it falls apart. Can you balance, can you not lose your mind when everything you love goes away? No, well, then you're not ready. Right. That would be no analogy. The, the, what is it? The Dharma of impermanence. The truth that things fall apart. Everything based on conditions comes apart again. And when we attach to stuff, it hurts. We need analogies. We can't quite hear that. So the, there's a wonderful sutra called the Dhammapada. The Dhammapada, Fa Ju Jing, that the Buddha spoke early to his first disciples that is full of analogies. If you look at the Dhammapada, it's everybody's favorite because you get to hear about, ooh, the rain has come. You get to hear about the bow and the arrow. You get to hear about the cart. You get to hear about the wheel. And the Buddha points to these aspects of nature, and these aspects of human civilization, basic things that we all know. We know about wheels. We know that they have to be round. We know that they have to have spokes and that there has to be the hollow in the center for it, the axle to, to read, you know. And the Buddha uses these very simple, a pot, talks about how the pot has to, can hold things because there's no holes. And what's the analogy for the pot is the precepts. If the, the precepts are a container that hold the vessel of wisdom and the, the water of wisdom, and as soon as there's a broken precept, there's a hole in the pot and all the wisdom leaks out. You go, oh, I get that. Mm, yeah, that's true. I see that, yeah. You know, so Manjushri is speaking gently to Sudhana using these, now these pictures of things that we're familiar with so that something that we don't understand, which is the incredibly profound, deep, wonderful Dharma, comes closer. And you can get it, you can kind of, yeah, I understand the analogy, so I guess I understand the Dharma. If he spoke directly, we wouldn't be able to, to hold it. So, he spoke the Buddha Dharma. He brought up that wisdom from the depths, from the spelunking cave to share with Sudhana. And he's explaining it skillfully, expediently. Now, what happens next is we get 10 descriptions of what Manjushri said. Of all the things that Manjushri could have taught Sudhana, what did he pick out? What did he choose to get him 
the job here, and by the way, the rain is falling really hard all of a sudden, instantly, we had a downpour here. Um, this morning we had almost 20 children uh, gathered for our kids' workshop, and as soon as we gathered, the rain stopped. Thank you, dragons. And yes, I did sing Puff the Magic Dragon. And after that, kids had lunch and went home. The rain recommenced. By golly, good timing. So, what did Manjushri choose to speak for Sudhana? He did, he spoke these things. He said, Buddhas continue. He said, Shuo yi chie fo ji ji fa. Uh, here, first one, that was number two, sorry. That Buddhas gather together. Huh. Why? Why would he start with that? Buddhas gather together. For GG. The gathering together of Buddhas? Buddhas gather together. Okay. Maybe that's to, because Sudhana needs to, Sudhana is on his way to Buddhahood. That's the journey he's being, this, what, what is this? This is Manjushri packing Sudhana's backpack for the trip. He's getting him ready. He's getting, he's going to, when he's done with the lecture that Manjushri is preparing for him, he's going to walk out with his hiking boots, with his sleeping bag, with his ground cloth, with his tent, with his instant meals, with his pot, with his portable backpacker stove and the fuel for it and a medical, a, you know, a blister kit for when his feet swell up. This is, he's on the road. This is the, the gear that, Man, that Sudhana is going to need for the journey that he's going to take him beyond 12 years. It's, it's longer. It's, it's many, many years, a decade plus. Sudhana is going to be on the road. So this is Manjushri preparing him for that journey. Okay, the Dharma that Buddhas gather together. Furthermore, Buddhas continue. For Yan Shu, right? Ji Shu. Is that what it was? It was Shang Shu for Shang Shu Fa. The Dharma of Buddhas continuing. So um, I was shocked to, to find out when I got to Gold Mountain that there's more than one Buddha in the Mahayana. I didn't know that. Then I discovered, oh, you know what? There's more than two. You know what? There's Shakyamuni, but he talked about Amitabha. You know what else? There's also Medicine Buddha. Oh my goodness. You know what? There's a Buddha to come. Maitreya is coming. Oh, the Buddha who spoke the Abhatamsaka? That's Vairochana. He's right there behind me. So it's like, wow, this is a different way of talking about Buddhism. Then we heard about there are seven Buddhas of antiquity. Then we heard that there are Do Bao Rulai, Bao Sheng Rulai, Miao Si Shen Rulai, Guang Bo Sheng Rulai, Li Bu Wei Rulai, Gan Lu Wang Rulai, Ami To Rulai. All these different Buddhas in the Mahayana. Why isn't this talked about in the Pali texts? Different people are ready to hear different things. Does that make the Pali text wrong? Does that make the Mahayana text false? None of the above, right? These people can hear different things. They're ready for different things. Uh, the Buddha, uh, the, the Holy Bible gives us the Hebrew scriptures and it also gives us the Gospels. People are ready for different things. Okay? So it's funny, the Methodism that I was raised in uh, in middle America, the pastor who was trained in the very seminar that I taught in for 10 years, pastors built their sermons around a piece of the Old Testament and then the message of the Gospels. It was a blend because that was how Methodism came through England to America. That's the state of the Methodist Church at the time. So every tradition coexists and is there to feed the spiritual needs of different people at different times. So the Buddhas continue. They do indeed. 
Shakyamuni Buddha is the fourth Buddha number four of the uh, Bhadra Kalpa, the Xian Jie, the worthy eon, the eon of goodness. Uh, Maitreya is going to be number five. He spoke the Dharma of Buddha's succession. They succeed each other. He spoke the Dharma of the purity of the Buddha's assemblies. The Chinese was Zhong Hui Qing Jing Fa. Um, what's that about? We, in, in the, the two scrolls leading up to where we are now, scroll number three, there was this f strange interlude of the beings who couldn't hear. All the people in the assembly who had no idea what was going on. <laughs> that was, there was a fairly lengthy section about that. And, okay, it's good to know that, that the, the importance of making vows of bodhisattvas in order to really take advantage of seeing everything that's happening. That was that, that very unusual, unexpected section. And I, because I hadn't tried to explain the Ru Fa Jiepin entering the Dharma realm, I didn't know that that was there. And then when we, we came upon it, then, oh, okay, lots of treasures. Likewise, I didn't know about the dragons coming out and getting their special sutra. Right. Next, check this one out. The Dharma of Buddha's Dharma wheels that transform and guide beings. Here it is. It's Yi Che Fo Fa Lun. Hua Dao Fa. Dharma wheels. We have been working, we translate every week, translate the Avatamska, and we, this is one of the Buddha's names, was Dharma wheel, I forget the, the other modifiers of it. And together uh, we investigated why a wheel. Now I guarantee, take a look, if you go out, let's uh, bring up. Okay, new window, here we go. And now we're gonna go out. I'm gonna type into my search engine, Buddhism, just Buddhism, Buddhism. Okay, now what comes up? Let's click on Wikipedia, Buddhism. What comes up? Look at that. There is a wheel. The wheel is the encyclopedia's symbol for all of Buddhism. Interesting, huh? So, eight spokes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Empty in the middle, eight spokes. Dharma wheel, huh, how interesting. So, the point that I'm showing you this is to say that these wheels, Buddha's Dharma wheels, is a symbol for Buddhism entirely, all of Buddhism. The encyclopedia, online encyclopedia, picked up one symbol, here it was, the wheel. Um, if we were gonna symbolize the Mahayana school, it wouldn't be the wheel. It would be a lotus flower for the Bodhisattva path. So what is it about wheels? We. Uh, boy, in order to define this, to answer this, we had a really, what you call a robust discussion. <coughs> we had people bringing in commentaries from the Tang Dynasty, bringing in Master Hua's commentary, bringing in other translators' versions of it. And the, uh, the best wisdom is that, number one, wheels have no start and they have no end. So, the wheel symbolizes wisdom and teachings that continue and continue. That the same way that wheels turn, likewise, the Dharma has no edge. The principles and the truths that the Buddhas bring up from their spelunking journey down to the depths of the mind is eternally. It's called the Changju, San Shi, Shi Fang San Shi, Changju. Fa Bao, it's called. The Dharma treasure that exists through the past, in the present, and on into the future 
in all ten directions. That's the way they describe it. So there's that. The other thing is that wheels roll over things. And it's slightly an analogy here it's a small, to say that when you speak the Dharma, it crushes demonic teachings. <laughs> There's something scary about it. You can see the wheel just flattens everything else that is not true in the past, true in the present, true in the future, or something that is partial. If it's partial, it won't roll. If you've got seven spokes, when you get to that empty one, it falls apart and the vehicle stops. Okay, so wheels transport, they carry, they roll, they have no beginning, they have the middle, they are perfectly round. If you think of your bicycle, have you ever trued the spokes on a bicycle? True as a verb, right? And bicycle spokes, you have to get that little wrench and make sure they're equal distance. If you got one that's shorter, because you didn't true it up with a little like that, when the tire, when your bike tire turns, it's going to flatten, you get a flat tire. So it has to be perfectly the same length. All of, these are all the descriptions for Dharma wheels. And step away from the analogy of the wheel, you just say it's the Dharma. When we hear it, if we're able, we change. How do we change? It talks about the middle way. If we're excessive in our character, we reduce it, pull it back, so that we match the Dharma mold. If we're deficient, it adds to us, so that we can become more courageous, a little more bold, a little more willing to try, a little more patient. Then we fit the mold, and fa hua, it changes us, we transform. That's the beauty of the Dharma, my goodness. Um, how do you see it? At the Berkeley Monastery, there were, um, in the, we started in 1995, and over the years, um, the, the, assemb the, the audience, the, the community that I moved into, I was living in Burlingame, down by the San Francisco airport at the time as a graduate student, going every day across the bay to attend class and to become a, and to teach my classes. So moved to Berkeley, 1995, and a fellow monk came with me. His name was Hung Xian, and he was formerly, before he uh, ordained, he was, among other things, a general in the Vietnamese, the army of South Vietnam. He was also uh, a governor of a province, one of the smaller provinces in Vietnam. So he was a kind of a, a, a nobility in Vietnamese society and a military guy. And he had come uh, in 1975 to the US and set his family up, had uh, children who were very successful. And uh, he had, at, at a certain point, met Master Xuan Hua and said, I'm going to be a monk. And uh, he had, uh, he was a junior monk there at the Institute International Translation Institute in Burlingame, where we were located. So when the Berkeley Monastery got underway, Hung Xian accompanied me. The two of us um, set up the Berkeley Monastery for that first initial year. And uh, his, so many local Vietnamese Buddhists came to Berkeley, came together. So our community grew up um, with a large, maybe half, of our Berkeley Monastery are Vietnamese Americans um, from all over Vietnam. And I, got, I de began to develop my hearing. I could tell by listening whether the accent this, of the Vietnamese spoken by this individual came from the center of Vietnam, Hue, which was a di very different spoken Vietnamese, very soft, very gentle, uh, very nice to listen to, or whether they came from the north. And the north, the accent of the north close to China tends to be a little heavier. Um, I could tell by listening. Or they spoke a very standard Saigon, southern Vietnamese accent, very fluent, uh, 
more involved in business, so a little quicker and a little more musical. I could tell, although I speak no Vietnamese whatsoever, they laugh at my accent when I try, but I could tell North, Middle, or South Vietnam. And uh, the, the point of my giving this analogy about the Dharma wheels that transform the Chinese was, let me see here again, the Chinese was Fo Fa Lun Hua Dao Fa. Manjushri spoke for Sudhana, the Buddha Dharma wheel that teaches and guides. The Dharma of the Buddha Dharma wheel that teaches and guides. Manjushri picked that to teach to Sudhana. The Dharma of Buddha's Dharma wheels, the transforming guide beings. Okay, here's the point. So what I, what I saw with the development of the Berkeley Monastery over, that was 95, so we've been almost 30 years there in this place. A generation has been through. The first group that came were the very faithful Buddhists who had been Buddhists in Vietnam and just brought their faith direct to the US and found Master Hua, who was renowned in Vietnam as one of the great Chan masters. So they came right over. Okay, we're going to, we're, we're here for you. Thank you for bringing your temple. We're gonna come and cultivate here. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh my, Saturday afternoons would, uh, <laughs> I, some of the world's best vegetarian pho, let me tell you. I learned about ban xiao and ban yong and all the different kinds of noodle dishes and, and oh man, I, the, the food that came out of the Berkeley Monastery kitchen on, on Saturday noon was legendary. So uh, anyway, often the family member who, should I play some music while you get shifted over there? <laughs> okay, we're, we're, our team is, is here, all the volunteers are helping out. So um, what I discovered was often in a couple, in a family, the wife was the real devout Buddhist and the husbands maybe were a little slower. Uh, maybe they would sit out of the car and smoke while the wife was in bowing to the Buddha. And the husband's like, no, I don't do that. She's the Buddhist. I'm a scientist. <laughs> She's the Buddhist. I, I am getting my, my company is going IPO. I don't have time for this religious stuff. That often, this, we would find this to be the case, that one member of the couple would be the faithful one, or it was the grandparents who were the faithful Buddhists, and they would be inside, and mom or dad would drive them, but they wouldn't come in. And over time, uh, especially after we, we made two decisions, that really kept the Berkeley Monastery, the kind of established us. One decision was the standard teaching among religious communities is that what you want are young couples. That's how your church will grow. Get all the young couples. Well, that might have been true in the 60s or 70s, uh, getting churches started. But by the time it got to us in the 90s, um, it's called the graying of the congregations. People were getting older. Graying meaning gray hair. The, the mainstays of the church were now, in their 60s and 70s, retirees. And if you wanted your church to get to really be strong, you needed to appeal to the elders. Somebody made that clear to us. Uh, at because I was teaching at the seminary, so that was one of the topics, was the graying of the, con of the pews, they call it the graying of the pews. The church pews with the people sitting in them were getting older and older, their hair was turning gray. So what we said was, you know what? Here we are, trying to bring in young couples. Well, if the, because Asian families pretty much always have more than one generation, usually the young couples live with their parents. So if you have, you know, uh, newly married 20-somethings, they will probably be living with 
grandma or grandpa at home. So you want the young couple to come. They have to keep one of the parents home with the, grand, with the elders so only, you'll only see the husband or the wife. If, you want, if we want to grow our community, appeal to the elders. Well, what do the elders want? The elders want to be able to hear something that they understand, which is often in Vietnamese or in Chinese. So provide translation. So we did. We went through a whole series of headphones and a whole series of uh, little amplifiers so that a translator in Vietnamese or in Chinese could sit there, just like we have here in our room today, right this minute, here in the Gold Coast Armor Realm, we have uh, a in-house translation system so that people sitting here today are listening in Chinese here, not Vietnamese in Gold Coast, but in Chinese. Same system, we set it up in Berkeley Monastery so that the elders, we invited the elders, we told the parents, bring grandpa and grandma together. We will put them in the center, give them a warm blanket, give them a comfortable chair, and give them a headphone so they can hear what I'm saying in the Vietnamese that they want to hear or the Chinese. Well, they did. And the elders came and we had a special area for them. If we didn't have the headsets, somebody would sit with them and translate on the spot. So I would be talking in English and there would be a second voice in the background speaking Vietnamese, sitting with the elders. And that elders community became our strength. Meanwhile, now that we've got the elders, we can also bring in the kids. So the second decision we had was to create Great Strength Academy. We called it. Great Strength Bodhisattva, Dasha Jirpusa, Shirjir Shiyuan. The kids were came along and they were in the back, the back of the monastery doing their summer Sunday school on Saturday night. And we had uh, because the scholarship, the study tradition in the Vietnamese community is really strong, uh, as it is in the Chinese community. So these kids, there were plenty of teachers. In our, in our group who volunteered to miss the lecture but stay with the kids in the back and teach them handwriting, teach them Vietnamese language, uh, give them uh, supplementary studies on mathematics or geometry, whatever they needed in their studies, or have a cooking class, or on holidays do pumpkin carving, uh, on Christmas do gingerbread houses, just a homemade curriculum so that the kids had fun. They could stand it. It wasn't deadly boring. And then at the end of the lecture from 9 to 9.30 at night, everybody would come together and it was story time. And I would bring out the puppets and go to the Berkeley Library children's floor to research stories and get, you know, get them ready. And the kids would come in from the back the elders would be there and, and the parents were kind of, you know, sleeping because they were exhausted from trying to keep their elders happy and the kids happy and their job going. So it was the whole family was there. But those two decisions of bringing the elders into the center and teaching to them in the language they understood, providing for their physical needs so that they felt comfortable and safe. And then having the kids come in uh, from the Sunday school with the volunteer teachers and listen to stories. So suddenly the Berkeley Monastery tripled in size in the community and I learned about the power of families. And uh, okay, now that member of the family, the husband or the wife who didn't want to come in realized that everybody was having fun inside and they would drop off their spouse and then kind of peek in around the door. What's going on in there? Hmm. And then, oh, you want to come in? Well, you can't smoke in here. Oh, well, I guess I can do without the cigarettes. Maybe, maybe I'll, let's see. And it's the lunch is when? Saturday, huh? 
Can you add some hot sauce to the pho? Your vegetarian pho is too bland. I want plenty of hot sauce. Okay. Well, uh, oh, guess who showed up? Oh, Mr. So-and-so is now here. Uh, he was always out in the street in, behind his wheel waiting for his wife to be done with her Buddhist stuff so he could take her home. Well, he's now in there enjoying a bowl of vegetarian pho with hot sauce. And now it's time. Oh, uh-huh. Uh, you're asking him to speak about what he does for his living? Uh-huh. Maybe he uh, has a story from Vietnam that he could share. You know, it's like well, bit by bit by bit. Now we've got two couples, both, both halves of the couple, in the monastery. And now we have an outing. Oh, okay, so he's going. He's a driver for his kids and his wife and grandma and grandpa down to Pescadero coastline to see the elephant seals, which is a you know 40 minute drive from the monastery. And the elephant seals have now come up out of the depths. They dive a mile down. Their, their, their bodies are so fat, they don't get cold. They come up for about a month on the Pescadero coast. They beach themselves. The elephant seals are incredible. One ton of elephant seal, you know. And so we go into the, on a, a beautiful side trip to see the elephant seals. Then uh, after that, they're kind of in the group. And then they come and listen to the sutra. And bit by bit, the, Without it, I saw this happen three with three families. The, the person who was out in the street behind the, the wheel of the car smoking cigarettes waiting for the spouse to finish is now <coughs> has his or her seat assigned. Every, they don't miss a lecture. They're always in that, at that bowing bench listening to the Dharma. The Buddha Dharma Hua Dao is there to how do they say it? To transform and guide beings. Uh, and it's amazing how it happens. Uh, Manjushri spoke the Dharma of the hallmarks and characteristics of the Buddhist physical bodies. Um, it is the point that it's true that um, Ananda Somehow, every time I touch it, it goes click. I don't know what it is. Every time I move. What do you suppose it is? Something. Funny. Okay. We'll work it out. Um, Ananda was the Buddha's own cousin. And what brought him in from scholarship to the Sangha was his, his cousin's appearance the Buddha's appearance, the 32 hallmarks and 80 subtle characteristics. Ananda was said to be personally very handsome, a good-looking guy. Um, he was the younger, younger cousin of the Buddha. And yet, when he looked at his older cousin, he said, I want to be like him. So it was the hallmarks and characteristics, Dharma, of the Buddha's physical body that even brought in Ananda, how much the more so Sudhana. So Manjushri is saying, Sudhana, you want to look like the Buddha? Hmm. Welcome. You're in the right place. So he spoke the Dharma of how the Buddhas bring their Dharma body into being. That's profound. Because the Dharma body can't be seen. It's what the Christians call the kingdom of God is the Buddha's Dharma body. Same thing. He spoke the Dharma of the Buddha's eloquence and phrasing and expression. We talked about that last, last time, about eloquence. Uh, there it is. The ci wu ai bian cai. Fa wu ai bian cai. The, elo the un unimpeded eloquence phrases dharma, meaning, and joy in speech. The dharma of Buddha's illuminating light. There you go. Talk about that to bring in somebody, and the Dharma of Buddha's impartial non-duality. Um, let's, let's look at this for just a minute. People, um, so the, the Chinese of that is fo ping deng wu er fa. There's a, 
um, this is a true story. When people ask me, um, what is it about Buddhism that's going to attract Westerners or contemporary, let's say, 21st century people, uh, one of the first things I talk about is the, you could say, democratic, small d democratic nature of Buddhism. It's min um, xin, right? That's to say, I could go in many directions with that, but it's not politics. Let's say gender. Gender. The idea that Buddhism is going to appeal to women and does appeal to women. And so I was at the seminary, Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley on Holy Hill, the uh, largest religious consortium in academia. So in, in among uh, theological schools, Shen Shui Yuan, right? So um, the topic was gender and I was there, this, this sounds like a joke, it's one of those jokes, you know, the, uh, the rabbi and the, the priest walk into the bar, you know. But it is, it's exactly that. I was sitting with a friend who was a rabbi teaching at the, the uh, Center for Jewish Studies and there was a Lutheran minister who was one of my thesis advisors and the topic was gender and we were, I wouldn't say competing, there wasn't competitive, but this is how it happened. The rabbi said, oh, you know, said, we are very progressive in my version of Judaism, of which there are many different flavors of Judaism, many different degrees of, of uh, orthodoxy. And he said, we are very progressive. He said, we ordain women as rabbis. I said, I was, just this last weekend, I was part of bringing this very wonderful young woman into the rabbit, rabbinate, and she passed her, all of her exams, and she gave her speech showing, she gave her acceptance speech showing her skill with ancient Hebrew, and she was a cantor before, and she has a beautiful singing voice, so she can be both rabbi and cantor if need be. And uh, we were just thrilled to have bring her on board, and there's a congregation waiting for her. And so I, that's really wonderful. That's really wonderful. And the, the uh, Lutheran minister is like, yes, that's excellent. We're so glad to know that women are allowed in Judaism to be leaders of the community. And uh, so the Lutheran minister says, Yes, yes, yes. He said, I am part of the, uh, the ELCA. This is the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, uh, different from the Missouri Synod, which is called the Misery Synod, which doesn't, agra doesn't allow women. But we, we do, the Evangelical Lutheran Caucus. We have been ordaining women into the priesthood for decades now, two or three decades. And uh, said, we, there have been, we're, we're you know, creating new history in the Lutheran Church for our ability to turn women into leaders. And so the rabbi said, that's glad to know that. Wow, for quite a while, huh? Excellent, excellent. I'm like, that's wonderful. They both looked at me and said, and you Buddhists, are you misogynist? When are you going to have women uh, of equal stature with men? I said, well, the first Buddhist nuns uh, appeared 2,500 years ago during the Buddha's lifetime. In fact, the Buddha, one of his own family members, became the first Buddhist nun. So yes, we, we're, in our, we're heading into our third millennium now uh, with women as leaders of the Buddhist community. And they're like, oh, that's very good. We're, that's very progressive. We're glad to hear that. Yes, we're, you know. So not to say we're competing, but this really did happen. They were like, oh, we didn't know that women could be leaders in Buddhism. Oh, yes. If you go to Taiwan, for example, you have an example of Tsuji Gong De Hui, Tsuji uh, Social Service Organization, and Dharma Master Zheng Yan is uh, probably an example of the Bodhisattva path and, on two feet. She is remarkably, she's created five 
hospitals in Taiwan that uh, you can go for free if need be. And, and anyway, there's also Bhikshuni Shaohui who uh, passed away now, but uh, she created a university, Huafan University, and there's Bhikshuni Shaoyun, and there's uh, Bhikshuni Hengqing, who uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama goes to when he wants information about the Bhikshuni Sangha, you know, and she's my ordained by Master Shrenhua. So women outnumber men in the Dharma Realm Buddhist Association four to one. So we talk about democracy. You talk about how did it go? It was Fo Ping Dang Wu Arfa, the Dharma of Buddha's impartial non duality. Yeah, yeah. And I remember uh, Elder Bhikkhu Bodhi, we had gathered in Hamburg, Germany, it was already a decade ago, to uh, talk about the status of women in Buddhism. And this was a large conference with representatives from every tradition, Tibetan tradition, Pali tradition, Mahayana tradition, uh, all gathered together. And uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi gave one of the closing speeches and he said, the Buddha spoke the Dharma for all living beings. Do you suppose it would be possible for the Buddha to speak the Dharma for only half of the human Dharma realm, eliminating another half? That wouldn't make sense. He spoke Dharma for everyone. We're all going, there you go, that's it, that's it. Could the Buddha speak Dharma for only half of the human Dharma realm? Ren fa jie, yiban. No, it's not going to happen. The Buddha spoke the Dharma to help all beings wake up. So there you go. I like that. I'm really happy to be part of a teaching that includes all beings. And now there are, there are people who will say, yeah, but you don't know the real story. There's a glass ceiling. Do Buddhist nuns take disciples? Yeah, they can. Dharma Master Bhikshuni Chengyan has female disciples. Are men and women different in Buddhism? Yes, they are. They have teachings, they have different precepts because it's also a real world Dharma. And there, the Buddha was wise enough to uh, create structures that sustain women in the world. In India at the time, women were property. Women were considered, uh, if the husband died young, uh, one alternative for the woman was to throw herself on her husband's pyre, her funeral pyre, his funeral pyre, because she was the, there wasn't any provision for widows at the time. So, yeah, the Buddha said, no, that, that won't work. We want to create a structure that allows women to sustain their lives in community, and they need different training rules to do that. So it's savvy uh, in its real-world dharma meant to sustain uh, religious, spiritual livelihood of different genders. Where uh, we've been talking about dragons, and we have the story of the dragon girl. The dragon girl who, in a woman's body, uh, made the offering to the Buddha of the thing she valued the very most, which was her pearl. And uh, the Buddha said, okay, well, you can go be a Buddha in the, the southern world now. Go. And she transformed into a man's body and became a Buddha on the spot. All the other disciples are like, how did that happen? That's, that can't happen. So Buddha said, you don't know her conditions. She was uh, her gong de yuan man, right? One de bei. Her 10,000 virtues were complete. She became a Buddha. So it's like, okay, there we go. That's another way to describe what? The Dharma of Buddha's impartial non-duality. So, okay, so what happens then is Sudhana hears this and he goes, I'm inspired. It's possible. I can, I'm ready. I want to go cultivate the way full-time 
and become a Buddha. So, all right. Manjushri. Manjushri is very cool. We find out so much about Manjushri Bodhisattva in this, this chapter. A little more, just a little more, a little more text. Here we go. Shansai after the youth Manjushri spoke these dharmas for the youth Sudhana and the assembly, he once again exhorted them earnestly using analogies. He gave them energy, made them feel joyful, and inspired them to bring forth the resolve for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. He also helped them recall their good roots from the past. Then and there, he spoke the dharma for beings according to their potentials once again, and then he departed. His job was done. So, what did we hear today? We heard ten kinds of dharma that Manjushri picked out in order to teach Sudhana. And he exhorted them, the assembly, earnestly, using analogies. He said, Jayo, Jayo, Fu, Jayo. Right? Step on the gas, keep going. Using analogies, he told stories that they could connect to, to teach them, to encourage them to cultivate the way. I like this. He gave them energy, right? It says, he zeng zhang shi li. Um, red bull, he, air vitamins. The things he said made them feel energized. They might have been tired. They might have been thinking, boy, this good thing he came on the weekend because we've got to go to work tomorrow morning and this would have been, couldn't have made it to the park, to the, to the grove on a weekday work night. So they didn't, they didn't worry about that. They said, I feel so glad that I was here. I wish Manjushi would come more often. And then he said, you all can wake up you can be Buddhas. Don't think that this doesn't apply to you. If you can't become a Buddha, who becomes a Buddha? Sudhana? Well, yeah, he's, he can set everything aside. He's not married. He's, not, uh, he's got enough blessings that he can get food as a pilgrim. However, the Bodhi resolve is for you. You can wake up. You have everything you need. You have to arrange your conditions, but you can do it. And then, I like this part. This is really interesting. He said, Yo ling yi nian guo chu shan gan. Manjushri is so good at speaking Dharma that people who hear it hear an echo in their mind of, I must have, I think I've done this before. Why does that sound so familiar? Deja vu? What is it about what he's saying that I, I see doors open? Could it be that I've done this before? Hmm, why do these people look so familiar? Why do we meet here and now? Manjushri is able to do this because it's internal. What he's doing is he's waking us up to things that we already possess, but we cover over. And Manjushri's power, his, his light is so strong. It ain't me, babe. No, 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 it ain't. I'm just sitting here. Okay. We love it. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Everything should be good. All me, four, four. Maybe. Do you, does it do that for you? Maybe. Okay. 
So, something about the light that Manjushri sheds is able to go into people's minds and help wake them up. Then and there, he spoke Dharma for beings according to their potentials again, and he left. All right. How about that? Amazing. The next thing that happens is going to happen next week. Sudhana speaks. Sudhana gives us 37 song verses, 37 verses in a song to praise Manjushri. I've got it here. We're going to try to get some music that might work here. If not, I don't want to force it, but it sure looks singable. We're going to have to massage it a bit because it's all different lengths, lines. But Sudhana's replies to Manjushri in an absolutely wonderful series of verses. And I, I'm going to, uh, here we go, stop the share. There it is. Um, give me a, a minute here, because I want to bring up something. Um, I'm going to park that down there for now. Um, here we go. Just a moment. Um, when I, I'm also uh, explaining, Let's see, I want, okay, there we go. I'm also explaining um, once a week the, uh, here we go, what's called the picture biography of Master Shrenhua. And that picture biography is quite wonderful. Let's see, I need to move on here. How do I go, let's see here, there we go. Oh, this is, here's the navigation, there we are. Okay. Um, in the picture biography of Master Empty Cloud is what I'm lecturing on once a week. And excuse me while I shift here. Um, there it is. Right there. Good, that's it. Okay, we're back. Um, this picture biography is... Um, the story of how another pilgrim, in this case... Uh, here we go. Master Empty Cloud, our grand teacher, uh, traveled through China going three steps, one bow. Now, um, he, uh, it's available, uh, if you go to Dharma Realm Live, our YouTube channel, you can watch it. Uh, it's going to be, it's 6.30 p.m. on Saturday night in California. It's 10.30 a.m. on Saturday morning here in Australia. Uh, it's Friday night, Friday night, 7.30, 6.30 p.m. Friday night, California. Uh, go to Dharma Realm Live YouTube channel and pick it up. Um, Master Empty Cloud nearly dies, frozen to death in a snowstorm, but he's saved by a beggar who mysteriously shows up on the share here to uh, serve him some hot rice uh, millet, uh, shao mi zhou, and saves his life after seven days of freezing in a uh, in an unprotected building in the snow. Um, the beggar Wenji shows up right on the spot, right in the nick of time, and uh, saves Master Empty Cloud, and then does it again later, Have saves his life twice. So that's a marvelous miracle rescue story, right? Quite, quite wonderful. Now, um, as I've mentioned multiple times, my Three Steps, One Vow pilgrimage was the second one in America. The first one was done by Bhikshu Hangju and Bhikshu Hangyo. Um, 
Buddhist monks who preceded me. I was there to witness their pilgrimage and was inspired by it. They, in turn, were inspired by Master Empty Cloud. Uh, Tim Testu, Bhikshu Hangju, and Bhikshu Hang Yo um, wrote about, they wrote a journal as well. They followed Master Shen Hua's admonition to keep a journal of their pilgrimage. And I wanted to share one of the stories from that pilgrimage right here. Another one of those, this is August 15, 1974. Hangju writes, I know that the print is real small, but I can't make it much bigger here. Another one of those hot, dusty days. Yes. Jerry. Not sharing it. Not sharing it? I thought I was. Thank you. There we go. Maybe I can make the print bigger. Can I do that? Yeah, I can. Here we go. Less. Ah, that's way too big. There we go. Ah. Problem is it unpaginates now. So. Uh, where? Oh, got to do it again. Sorry. Outsmarted myself. Going back. Almost there. Let's see here. What was that? September, was it? What was the date? Right here. There we go. One more time. Another one of those hot, dusty days. Heavy traffic, logging trucks, and afflictions everywhere. We bowed along Highway 20 into the little town of Van Horn. The Olsons, who own the general store and gas station, invited us in for a cool pop, meaning a soda pop. There was a lot of activity around the place. These folks had been hearing about us for months. Kids and dogs were milling around everywhere. And at one point, I noticed an old man, short, bearded, and bespectacled, wandering around outside the gas station. He was talking to the kids, and although I don't think he had ever been there before, he behaved like he was old friends with everyone. He had a white truck with a homemade trailer behind it, and two dogs that he was trying to give away. <laughs> I was taken aback when he walked up to me and asked me if I called myself a Buddhist. I noticed that he was totally relaxed and centered. Uh, wh why, uh, uh, yes, I replied, wondering what he was getting at. Do you want to hear what the Buddha taught in plain English? He asked. I didn't want to say no because that wouldn't be right. And I didn't want to say yes because that would imply that I didn't already know. I looked around and there was a small crowd gathering. He had a mischievous gleam in his eye. Well, well what did the Buddha teach? I finally said. The Buddha taught compassion. The Buddha said that we should stop knocking each other around but most people don't buy it. I was sure this little man could see right through me, but I quickly replied, b b by what? What the Buddha taught, laughed the little man. I don't think you're a complete convert, he said <laughs> to the big dignified monk. Boy, was he putting me on the spot. Uh, I didn't say I was perfect, I replied. I had shifted totally into my own defense. The little man paused. Then he moved closer, and he looked right into my eyes. Tim later said he had sunglasses on, and he took the glasses off and looked right into my eyes, looked up into my eyes. I was beginning to steadily flash on how angry I had become towards Hung Yo 
during the last few weeks. The Buddha taught compassion. Be more compassionate, he said. Then he took off his glasses and stuck his face about 12 inches in front of mine. I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend. How many people do you know who would talk to you like this? He said. <laughs> By the, this time, I was completely overwhelmed, not to mention embarrassed. I had never seen this guy before, yet he had zeroed right in to my number as if I was transparent. All the people were looking at me. Everything was quiet, and I was absolutely speechless. I didn't know what to do or say, so I went back out on the road and continued bowing. Only afterwards did I begin to realize just how miraculous an encounter it was. Just as the Master had often done, this man was talking right through my false front, directly to my attachments. As I bowed along, I began to feel a sense of shame that I hadn't felt in a long time. I really had been mean to Hung Yo in many, many ways. Most of the time, I was very indirect and subtle. Nevertheless, it was always very irritating. I felt terrible about it. I recall the verse the Master once wrote, Truly recognize your own faults. Don't discuss the faults of others. Being one substance with everyone is called great compassion. I scurried down the road until I reached the spot where Hung Yo was waiting with the cart. He had missed my little encounter with the old man, so I told him what had happened. We sat down and mixed up some lemonade powder with some fresh Skagit River water. I looked at him directly for the first time in a long time. For a short moment, we shared a smile of silent understanding. I felt old, old, old. And we both got up and continued on. There we are. So uh, the story continues that the next time they called Master Hua in San Francisco, and Tim didn't speak Chinese, but Hung Yo did. So Bhikshu Hung Ju relayed the story. Shifu said, did you bow to him? Tim said, no, I didn't bow to him. Shurpa said, who do you think that was? <laughs> and he said, I, I don't know, Shurpa. Manju Sri Bodhisattva! You idiot, you missed your chance. <laughs> I said, oh, no, maybe we can go find him. I can bow to him. No, too late, too late. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, yeah, the um, Manjushri is still there teaching. And Shurpa did say, he said, only because the two of you, Hung Ju and Hung Yo, had put in that effort, did Manjushri show up to speak Dharma. And he said, even though you didn't recognize him or bow to him, you got some priceless teaching that you earned by all of your effort, bowing, three steps, one bow. So, great story. Anyway, that is, oh, I need to, uh, for folks to be able to read that, Here's what you want. You want. Uh, where is it? I'm trying to get the, the. There we go. Here it is. Right here. Three steps, one bow. There it is. Oh, it's tricky. Anyway, uh, so it's called Three Steps, One Bow. And it's Bhikshu, H-E-N-G-J-U. Oh, I didn't, I wasn't sharing my screen. Shoot, couldn't see it. Um, here's what we'll do. We'll go out here. This is how to find it. Uh, go to, I want people to uh, go to Amazon and buy that book because it's very fresh. Plus, uh, there's a new edition, Three Steps, One Bow. Oops. Let's 
three steps, one bow. I want Kindle eBooks. There it is right there. That's what it looks like. Uh, American Buddhist Monks, 1100 Mile Journey for World Peace. Bhikshu, B-H-I-K-S-H-U, Hungju is the author, and Bhikshu Hungyo. This is, it's actually David Bernstein, but you can find it. There it is, that's the cover. Um, Tim Testu has another uh, volume out of his own writing, which you can find uh, if you look. Okay, available on Kindle. All right, uh, we're ready now to go, since I'm out there. I want to ask uh, Jin Chuan and Jin Wei, have you got anything to share with us? Yes, 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 yes. I do. There you are. Okay. The website is up. Go ahead. No, it's not. Actually, actually, I don't not think yet. so. Not yet. There it is. Got it. Uh, also, we hear an echo. Say again? We hear an echo. echo. North, 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 North. North. Okay. There you go. Okay. okay. So, uh, so uh, 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 say again. Oh, okay. Mute your mic. Oh, there you go. Oh, now you can hear us. So, tomorrow we have a special event at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. You can see is a big question is consciousness in the universe or is the universe in the consciousness? I don't know. Any of you ask yourself before. Right? Yeah, I was wondering how. Am I in the universe or the universe in my consciousness? Uh, but uh, we have a special guest who is now in the monastery, Professor Bogdan Staszewski, who is an, a professor in University College Dublin, Ireland who uh, is very well versed and an expert in the quantum mechanics and using some principles for quantum physics he actually with friends built the quantum computer prototype if you click that link dharma master you'll actually see his information yeah and doug said his brother actually went and checked on bogdan's background like wow this guy is the real deal <laughs> yeah he's you he says he's the dude yeah <laughs> Yeah, so, so you can read up on him if you want. He's quite quite uh, accomplished uh, scientist and engineer at the same time. So and as well, for four decades he's meditating. So it's a quite interesting combo. So tomorrow at the monastery at four p.m., he and Professor Doug Powers will have a conversation: the quantum mechanics meets Buddhism. Uh, you can join in person, uh, highly recommend. And also you can join online if you wish. You can register. Uh, you have to click over there and it will lead you to... There you go. This is the event details and a place to register. Mm -hmm. I think on the right side, it says reserve a spot. It's kind of confusing right there. You put reserve a spot. Yep. Yeah. There they are. So it's happening tomorrow. And, and following that, we plan to have still meditation at the monastery. We've been getting a good turnout, and people thought it'd be great to continue meditating. And we thought it'd be, given that the last event was on Yogacara and quantum physics. I mean, thought, tomorrow event. Tomorrow's event, yeah. We thought it would be great to continue our Saturday meditations, exploring Yogacara Buddhist psychology and exploring how does it relate to our consciousness using its insights to deepen our meditation practice. And how we can apply those principles in our everyday life. So the schedule is the same. We'll have a kind of a class gathering 9 to 11 in the morning, a lunch offered by the community. Please join us. And after that, after we clean up, starting around 12.30 to 3.15, we'll have... 30 minute sits with 15 minute walking in between with some instruction, maybe stretching. And if you're interested, please sign up. There's a registration there. Um, and it's on Saturday, March 2nd, and 
nine. So if you want to become a scientist of your mind, come and check it out how yeah. to work with your mind lab and my hard lab and with a good community and definitely food will not disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is the summer contemplative program, July 7th to 20th in Sudana Center hosted by DRBU. So if you know any high school students who wish to explore not just, you know, say, great books, but actually apply those insights that you read from the classics in their lives, this would be kind of the program for them. If you know of someone who really loves to read and have conversations and then actually apply what they learn in a real way, this is the place for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be really good. There's a lot of thought being put into I have a comment that green leaf right there that looks suspiciously yeah. like another kind of green leaf oh. <laughs> uh, in Mendocino County you might want to reconsider that uh, adding that <laughs> green leaf there I wonder maybe it's false advertising false advertising yeah yeah the holy herbs yeah, yeah. Yeah. So please uh, join in if you are interested. There's a link there for, with a lot more information. Mm -hmm. And okay. there is super. Oh, okay. Yeah. Everything. Everything else is the same. Yeah. Everything so, is the same. Um, another comment about our this this shows a link to Twitter and X. I don't I don't know if Twitter. At some point, we want to examine whether we want to be advertising on Twitter anymore. Twitter is in uh, death throes, and probably the sooner the better. So maybe we could, probably threads is the place to go. Anyway, if we're going to put it on a social network, Twitter is not the one of choice anymore. So, Okay, good stuff, everybody. Thank you for that. That's, that's really, there's a lot of stuff going on. Tomorrow's um, talk with Doug and Bogdan Staszewski, pretty special. Pretty special. Bogdan's is, as they said, he's the real deal. So uh, we're going to move on to another website. We have GCDR Chinese. Here we are. Oop. Ah, there we go. Um, what do I want to click on, Sam? Go down to the bottom. There we go. Okay. Uh, this is pictorial biography of Master Empty Cloud. This is Saturday events. Dabei Zhou, Lung Yan Zhou. Um, the blessing ceremony is done. Uh, Emperor Liang's repentance, March 9th, right there. Liang Hong Bao Chan. Meditation class on Saturdays. We're looking at the Heart Sutra. Precepts for the deceased is going to come up in March, uh, and a map, how to get here. Okay, Dajaya Jui, huh? GCDRChinese.com. Oh, dot com, okay. GCDR Chinese, no dot, GCDRChinese.com. All right, there you go. Good stuff. Okay, uh, let's dedicate merit and get everybody on with their Sunday and their Saturday evening. Please make a wish. I was explaining uh, dedication of merit to young people today, talking in the context of giving. And you can see young people get it right away to, to who they want to share with. It's really exciting to watch how this concept connects. So please make a wish where you'd like to send your merit.
heads and hearts can finally give me unity. They are miles away to bring compassion, wisdom, and to joy. They climb this fine reward. They all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. And we conclude today with bowing right from where you're sitting, if you're sitting, to the Buddhas and to Master Shrinhua. Here we go. Respect to the Venerable Master. Alrighty, that's going to do it for us for today. See you all next week. Glad you could join today.